Hello, my name is Jim Shaw, and I am an instructor for Federal Highway Administration training delivered under the National Highway Institute. The National Highway Institute, or NHI, is the training branch of the Federal Highway Administration. The videos you're about to watch are based on some of the training courses developed by the National Highway Institute, in particular, the Introduction to Highway Hydraulics course, NHI course 135065, and the Culvert Design course, NHI course 135056. I've been an instructor for National Highway Institute training courses for 25 years. I completed my undergraduate engineering degree at Purdue University and did my master's and PhD at Colorado State. The videos are based on demonstrations and experiments that we do primarily in these two training courses, built around a portable flume. The flume is six inches wide and approximately five feet long and recirculates water from a 30 gallon sump. The videos, there are six of them to watch. The recommended order in which to watch those videos, first open channel flow concepts, then great inlets, culvert hydraulic concepts, hydraulic effects of culvert liners, aquatic organism passage design concepts, and energy dissipators for culverts. Thank you for your interest in Federal Highway Administration training. I hope you find this video series helpful in completing highway drainage design projects. This video will demonstrate culvert hydraulic conditions. The purpose of the video is to see how different factors of a culvert influence the headwater, which is the amount of ponding at the upstream side of a culvert entrance, as well as how they might impact the velocity coming out of the end of the barrel. Those are the two primary design variables when we start talking about culvert hydraulics. Before we get into the actual model demonstrations, we need to define the basic concepts of inlet and outlet control. Inlet and outlet control are central to understanding the Federal Highway Administration culvert analysis methodology. When we say inlet control, it's as it sounds, the control is at the inlet of a culvert. Everything that matters is happening right here. If the inlet were not constricting the flow, the barrel could carry more water, but it's the conditions at the inlet that are restricting how much water gets into the barrel and how much headwater we have. Inlet control culverts are typically on a steeper slope and we have part full supercritical flow inside the barrel. In contrast, in outlet control, we're typically on a flatter slope. If we have part full flow, it's going to be subcritical or it could be full pipe. In fact, the only time we'll ever have full pipe flow in a culvert barrel is in outlet control. And as with inlet control, the word outlet control means specifically that the control point is at the outlet or sometimes further downstream in the tailwater condition so that everything about this culvert installation is important. The entrance condition, the pipe, the length of the pipe, the roughness, all matter. If we think about that for a minute, in inlet control, going back to the steeper slope barrel, when everything that matters is at the entrance to the pipe, then it really doesn't matter what's going on down here. That will not change the headwater condition if that's really true. Another concept to remember in hydraulics is when we say control, that has specific meaning. It usually means where the flow is passing through critical depth. So in this case, in inlet control, we're saying that the flow passes through critical and accelerates down the barrel to a supercritical flow condition. In outlet control, typically again, my flatter slope barrel, I would be at critical at the outlet or under tailwater control if the tailwater is submerging critical depth. There are a number of factors that enter into how a culvert operates hydraulically, and if we just look at the model, we can walk through those. Certainly the headwater, which is the ponding that occurs that helps overcome the energy losses 
in this barrel. The area, the size in other words of the barrel, the shape of the barrel, whether it's round, pipe arch, arch, elliptical, the barrel slope and inlet configuration, the barrel roughness, whether it's smooth, say an RCP pipe with an end value of 012, or a CMP pipe with an end value around 024, the barrel length as it affects the friction loss, and the tailwater condition as well. So there are eight factors. In outlet control, all eight are important. The control is at the outlet or the tailwater, the amount of flow getting through this barrel, the amount of headwater we have will be influenced by all eight factors. In inlet control on a steeper slope, only the conditions at the entrance matter. So the headwater, the area, the shape, and the inlet configuration are most important. The barrel um, slope has a little bit of effect in inlet control on the headwater condition. It has a larger effect actually on the exit velocity coming out of the end of the barrel. A steeper slope would have a higher exit velocity. So those are the basic concepts of inlet and outlet control. We're going to do the demonstration initially using a double barrel model. One side is rough pipe, simulating a CMP. The other side is smooth. I'm gonna start with the, the plug in the smooth barrel side and we'll start observing the changes in these factors. I can't show you everything of the eight factors that I listed. For example, my model is a two inch pipe. I can only show you a two inch pipe. It's circular, I don't have pipe arch or elliptical shapes. But otherwise, I can show you pretty much everything. Certainly by changing which barrel I send water down, we can look at roughness. I can raise the slope uh, we can look at barrel length by using one of my inlet models that we'll be referring to later. But this inlet model, we call it a groove in projecting, matches the head wall configuration on my barrels. I have a groove end, a socket end, if you will, so that I can insert my inlets. So by using the groove end inlet, I can extend the length of this barrel without changing the case of E. So we can look at length. Certainly I can vary tail water by putting stop logs at the end of the flume. So we can look at most all the factors and of course in the inlet configuration, I'll be changing and looking at a wide range of inlets and how that affects culvert hydraulic performance all the way from models with head walls to very specialized inlets, the tapered design inlets that provide great hydraulic improvement. So we'll start with the rough barrel pipe and we'll be monitoring the changes in headwater primarily on the stilling well. <clears throat> so the first question we always need to ask is whether we are in inlet or outlet control. A hint is that I'm on a pretty flat slope and outlet control is usually on your flatter slope barrels. The other indicator in my flume is that my pipe is running full. And again, you can only have full barrel flow when you're in outlet control. So we are in outlet control with water going down the CMP pipe. I'll mark the headwater here. And the first question that we'll look at is, how does length affect the headwater? And I'll do that again by using my groove in inlet to allow me to extend the culvert basically 25%. This is a two foot culvert model. This is a six inch inlet. So I'll be extending the length about 25%. So once I'm sure I've got a stable reading here, it looks pretty good. I'll put this on the front end of the barrel and we'll see the headwater starting to increase. 
The reason the headwater increase is in outlet control is because of friction loss. In outlet control, we have the entrance loss, the friction loss, and the exit loss. All three contribute to the headwater condition. In outlet control, we're basically applying the energy equation. We're applying it from the exit of the pipe at a known HGL. We calculate the energy losses that are occurring and project the upstream to get the upstream HGL. So anything that increases the energy loss will change the headwater condition in outlet control. So the question is, in terms of a real world scenario, you've got a roadway widening project and you go talk to the maintenance people and they say, you know, that, that 24 inch pipe has been working really fine for the last 30 years. We think you can just go ahead and extend it as part of the roadway widening project. You don't have to worry about the rest of the barrel. If you're in outlet control, you have to be careful because by extending it, you have increased the friction loss and where you might not have had an overtopping situation previously, in the roadway widening, you would end up with the potential for a higher headwater and possible overtopping condition. So that's the effect of barrel length. We can also look at the effect at this point of inlet configuration. I have a case of B of 0.2 in the flume right now with my groove end projecting. I'll switch that to what we call a thin edge projecting, which has a case of B of 0.9. And I'll go ahead and move this up to mark this starting point. And we should see a little bit of a change, but we don't see a huge change because in this outlet control scenario, the inlet loss is just one of three. And in fact, the friction loss, what's happening in the barrel, tends to be more dramatic and controls the hydraulic performance as much as the inlet or the exit loss. So we did see a slight increase here by changing the case of E from 0.2 to 0.9. So we've looked at the change in length. We've looked at the effect of inlet configuration. Let's go ahead and look at the tailwater condition. And I can do that by adding my stop logs. <clears throat> and the question is, I'll mark this headwater now. Will the headwater change as I start changing the tailwater condition? So these stop logs are one inch. The first one inch change has no influence on the headwater condition. So it appears that maybe tailwater isn't a factor. Well, it isn't a factor yet because what's happening is as my flow exits out of the barrel, remember we're in outlet control, and in hydraulics they control typically means we're passing through critical depth. So I am passing through critical depth as I exit this barrel and plunge into this low tailwater condition. This would be like a barrel, uh, say, in a overbank area or a relief culvert that is plunging into um, a pasture or a forested area. There's no tailwater to speak of. Well, let's increase the tailwater a little bit more so I can start to see if I have any influence. And of course, I won't have any influence until my tailwater drowns out critical depth. And that just happened. As you can see, we're starting to climb a little bit now. I'm gonna let this stabilize. And what's actually gonna happen now, and it's very interesting, a change in tailwater now is immediately reflected to the headwater. So if I had a one foot change in tailwater, I would see a one foot change in headwater. And the reason that is, we'll talk about that while this is still stabilizing, gets right back to the fundamental equation in outlet control, which is the energy equation. Remember, we're applying the energy equation from a downstream HGL, a known point. We calculate the energy loss and we get the upstream HGL. 
So now if there's no change in the energy loss, which my pipe is flowing full, so the velocity doesn't change, I have the same friction loss, I say I have the same entrance loss, I have the same exit loss. So if I raise the downstream tail water, the hydraulic grade line, the HGL, and I add the same energy loss, I'm gonna get this translated to the upstream side by the amount of the tail water. So we can do that. We should see this headwater rise basically by the amount of this stop log, which is one inch. You can see it going up. While that stabilizes, let's talk about another real world scenario. You've got a culvert that has been fine for quite a while and all of a sudden the landowner, the upstream landowner, is calling the DOT and saying, you know, I think there's some sediment in that culvert. The last couple rains, I've had flooding in my pasture and I've never had that problem since the last time you were here to clean the barrel. So could you send the maintenance crews out and have them clean out this culvert? So sure enough, you send a maintenance crew out and they do an inspection and they find, well, there's really nothing in that barrel. There's no sediment, there's no debris blockage. And you just conclude, well, you know, the, this fellow just has forgotten how bad it can flood when it really starts to rain around here. But sure enough, the next time it rains, he's on the phone again, wanting you to come out and fix the culvert. Well, it's quite possible that it was not anything at all related to the culvert. In fact, it could have been something off the right of way, perhaps quite a ways downstream if you're in flat country where the tailwater has changed. You're in outlet control, the tailwater's changed, and that effect is reflected all the way upstream to the headwater. It could be as simple as a tree falling into the channel. It could be perhaps a beaver pond got built. Maybe there was some bank caving, any one of a number of scenarios, but it had absolutely nothing to do with the culvert. So be aware of that, the, the importance of tailwater in outlet control, particularly when the tailwater takes over control of the, the culvert operation. And that happens again when the tailwater submerges critical depth. So I'll take these back out. <coughs> And what we'll do now is we'll switch over to the smooth barrel. So I'm gonna go from my end value of 024 approximately to an end value of 012. And with that change, we should see a reduced headwater because we'll have less friction loss. I'll use the same inlet, the thin edge projecting, and we'll start from that point. And as expected, the headwater has dropped due to this change in end value because again, in the outlet control, we're applying the energy equation and by reducing the friction loss, We've cut down the energy loss, the headwater will be lower. So we've looked at culvert length. We looked at the roughness. We've looked at inlet configuration. We've looked at tailwater. Let's go ahead and look at the effects of slope. Before I do that, while I can't demonstrate the effect of area and shape, a larger diameter barrel would have a lower headwater because of the larger flow area. And interestingly enough, some of the low profile pipes like an elliptical or a pipe arch would also have a lower headwater in outlet control because the center of gravity is lower on a low profile pipe. So for the same headwater elevation, I'm getting more pressure, more headwater, to move the water through the culvert. So let's go ahead and start increasing the slope and we're gonna do that and monitor a couple different things. I'll start by marking the headwater here, the headwater depth, but I also wanna pay attention to the headwater elevation 
which I'm going to monitor with this yellow scale. It's setting on the tabletop, so it's on my datum. So I'm using the words carefully here. I'm looking at elevation on the yellow scale versus headwater depth on my stilling well. And right now, it's about 12 inches is where my headwater elevation is. And so the question is, what will happen to the headwater depth and what will happen to the headwater elevation as I start to raise the flume slope? <clears throat> So let's raise it up a little bit. And what we see is the headwater depth has dropped, but the headwater elevation is still sitting at about 12. Now at first that might seem a little confusing. How could the headwater depth change but not the headwater elevation? Well, it gets back to the basic equation again, the energy equation. Remember, we're applying the energy equation from the outlet of the pipe to the upstream side. My control at the moment is critical depth as it plunges out of the end of the barrel. I'm, I haven't changed the energy loss. So when I project through the energy equation from the downstream HGL to the upstream HGL, that elevation doesn't change but the headwater depth does because I've raised the flume up. In essence, what I've done is redistributed the potential head terms. I've increased the elevation head, but I've reduced the pressure head. So what this tells you in outlet control is if you have a culvert with a clearance issue at the upstream side, perhaps it's a fiber optic line and you can't put it as deep as you would like to, you could raise it up to clear that utility, whatever it might be, without changing the headwater elevation, meaning the overtopping condition. You might change the depth, but you wouldn't change the elevation. Now, of course, as we continue to increase the slope, remember when we introduced the ideas of inlet and outlet control, I said a steeper barrel is typically on inlet control. So as I continue to raise the slope now, we're going to see this culvert transition from outlet control to inlet control. And we'll be able to see that because when that happens, there'll be a big air pocket that forms in the inlet of this culvert. And I can accelerate that a little bit. We'll start to see a vortex forming here that pulls air into the barrel. And we end up with what we're seeing now. We have a part full, super critical flow condition. We are in inlet control. Everything that matters now is happening right here at the entrance. It really doesn't matter what's downstream. And I can prove that by switching back to the rough barrel pipe. Now you might initially think, well, you know, this end value on this smooth pipe, this RCP is like 012. And if he switches that back over and runs water down the rough barrel, well, that's an end value of 024. So the, the headwater's got to go up. Well, let's find out. So I'm going to mark this now that we're pretty stable. <clears throat> okay, so we have a good stable condition in this smooth barrel pipe. And what I want to do is switch over to the rough barrel to prove to you that in inlet control, the only thing that matters is what's happening right here. It doesn't care what's downstream. And if that's true, when I make this switch, there should be no difference between the headwater elevation. So we'll do this. It'll take it a minute to stabilize because I momentarily have a double barrel culvert going. But we should come right back up to that same O-ring. And as you see, we're, we're getting there pretty quickly. So in inlet control, when we're in this steeper slope condition, rule of thumb for box culverts is anything over 1% tends to be in inlet control. What's happening downstream, whether it's the roughness of the pipe, the length of the pipe, even the tailwater condition, let me show you that, will not change this upstream headwater condition. 
So to do this, I'm going to add tail water, and what you'll end up seeing is a small hydraulic jump forming inside the barrel. So the hydraulic jump is sitting right about in here at the moment. And an important factor about hydraulic jumps that a lot of designers don't understand is that it's commonly thought that the hydraulic jump creates the downstream tailwater, when in fact it's the downstream tailwater that creates the hydraulic jump. Meaning, if I change this tailwater, I can move that jump back and forth. And the concern here is some states use a design called a broken back culvert, which is quite often a steep slope barrel coming to a flat slope near the outlet. And the designer says, oh yeah, I remember my fluids. You know, this is super critical because it's a steep slope. This barrel down here, you know, if I were to try to model that, something like that, is on a flat slope. So I'm going to have a hydraulic jump right here, and I'm going to have a nice tranquil flow exiting the barrel, and I don't have to worry about energy dissipation. That is true only if there's enough tailwater here to make that jump happen inside the barrel. And if not, that jump will sweep out and start creating serious erosion problems downstream. <clears throat> okay, so that's the effect of tailwater and inlet control. It, it didn't really change the upstream headwater. It wouldn't change the headwater until we put so much tailwater on it that we push that jump all the way upstream and out of the end of the barrel. And then we've transitioned from inlet control to outlet control. Okay, so if I've proven to you that there is no difference in inlet control with what the pipe material is downstream, I'm going to take the double barrel model out and put in the single barrel, which is a smooth pipe only, because it allows me to demonstrate my headwall models, which I can't do in the double barrel model. So let's make that change. And just so you don't think there's some magic going on here, I'm going to start with a block on my barrel and demonstrate all the models until I get to what's called a slope tapered inlet, at which point I'm going to take this block off because with a slope tapered inlet, it's called that because we elevate this part of the inlet, it slopes down to this point. So if I rotate the barrel back down, I'm going to be putting this entrance, it'll be daylighting at the same position as all the other models that I'm demonstrating so that there's no change in the upstream condition. So we'll start with the block on. And when I get to that last inlet, which is the slope tapered model, I'll have to lift this out and pull the block off. And that's why I'm doing that. We're going to go through the inlets in order of K sub E starting with a thin edge projecting. This would be like a CMP projecting from the fill. The K sub E, which is the entrance loss coefficient, we multiply that K sub E times the velocity head to get the energy loss with that inlet. The K sub E for the thin edge projecting is 0.9. This has the highest energy loss of any inlet type we have. That's not to say it's a bad practice. There are many CMP pipes projecting from the fill in the highway business. We just need to know that it creates the highest energy loss. So let me put this in the flume and we'll make a mark at the headwater. This will be our reference point. And then as we work through the other case of E values and reduce the energy loss, we'll see a corresponding change in the headwater elevation. While that's adjusting, if we look at the flow conditions in the barrel, we see that we are now in part full flow. In fact, it's part full supercritical. We're in inlet control. And this big air pocket, particularly on a thin edge projecting like a CMP, 
is a real risky factor for our design because there's such a buoyant force created, it's a little bit like trying to hold a 55 gallon barrel under the water. As a result, a common failure in inlet control with this air pocket on a thin edge projecting from that buoyant force is the barrel actually rotating about the fill and bending upwards. Because of that, Federal Highway Administration recommends barrel sizes, particularly over 48 inches, should be anchored because the larger the barrel, the greater that buoyant force. We have seen similar failures on smaller pipes. So be aware of that on a thin edge projecting and inlet control. This is a, a concern for failure. Our headwater is fairly stable. I'll adjust the O-ring. We're very near the top of the stilling well. So this is our starting point. We'll start working now through our case of E values. The first one is what we call mitered to the slope. This has a case of E of 0.7. At times, I'll be using my pitot tube to help get the air into the barrel. Eventually, if we wait long enough, it will make this transition. And that air is a result of typically the vortex that you see at the entrance during inlet control. That's a pretty good indicator out in the field. If you're out during a flood and you're looking at the upstream side of a barrel and you see a big vortex, more likely than not, that culvert is in inlet control. So we have the same supercritical part full pipe condition. Give it a minute to make sure it's stable. I'll go ahead and start marking it here. So with the case of E of 0.7, we see a small decrease in the headwater as a result of the changed energy loss, the reduced energy loss with this mitered to the slope configuration. The next entrance we'll look at, we call it a thick edge projecting. The case of E is 0.5. This would be like an RCP pipe that's been cut off. The, the groove end projecting or the socket end has been cut off, exposing that thick edge of the concrete. Let's see where the headwaters will go with a case of E of 0.5. So again, supercritical flow, part full in the barrel, running the full length of the barrel on this thick edge projecting. And as expected, we see a slight decrease from our case of E value of 0.7. Another inlet with the same case of E value would be a head wall with a square edge. I'll be comparing that shortly to a head wall with a bevel. So the head wall with a square edge also has a case of E of 0.5. If we had our thin edge projecting pipe with its case of E of 0.9 and wanted to improve the entrance configuration, the entrance loss condition, one option would be to put this CMP pipe in a head wall with a square edge and that would reduce the case of E from 0.9 to 0.5. So we should see this come back to the same spot as the, the O-ring that marked the case of E of 0.5 for the thick edge projecting. And as you can see, we're, we're right at about that spot. So I'll go ahead and switch over to the case of E now of 0.2, which is the same head wall, but now we have a bevel. The bevel on this head wall is a 45 degree bevel. It follows the Federal Highway Administration design standard described in hydraulic 
design series number five on culvert design. It amounts to about a half inch per foot of barrel diameter. So it's not a very large bevel. Even if you take, say, a six foot diameter pipe, we're only talking about a three inch bevel. So it's a combination of that reduced case of E at 0.2 now and the, the, uh, the bevel reducing the contraction effect as we get into the pipe, causing the improved hydraulic performance. So once this is stable, I'll mark this spot for our head wall with a bevel. The benefit of a bevel is primarily an inlet control, but because there's also a little less energy loss associated with it, it's a recommended practice in outlet control. Meaning, if you're gonna have a head wall standard, you might as well have a head wall with a bevel, and whether it's an inlet or outlet control, you'll see some improvement. Certainly, more improvement in inlet control, because again, everything that matters is right here, and anything we can do to help the water get into the barrel will make better use of this pipe that we have downstream. So there's our case of E of 0.2 with a bevel. We have one more case of E point value of 0.2, which would be our RCP pipe with the socket end projecting upstream, or the groove end as it's called at times. While that is not a bevel, it does create what I call a step bevel. So you get a similar hydraulic performance. We should see this one as well come back to this very same location of a case of E of 0.2 or very nearly the same location. And it's creeping up fairly close to that. So while that's stabilizing at that, I'll introduce the next two inlets we're gonna look at. These are called tapered inlets. These are by far the most hydraulically efficient inlet designs that we can come up with. There are two standards in the Federal Highway Administration practice as described in HDS 5. One is a side taper, the other is called a slope taper. Let's look at the side taper first. It's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's a flare side to side with no change in the vertical dimension. Little complicated geometry on a circular pipe. There are some concrete pipe manufacturers that have the forms to do this. There are some metal pipe manufacturers that can create this. Certainly on a box, on a cast in place in particular, it would be a fairly easy construction to flare the ends keeping the vertical dimension the same. So this is called the side taper. You can see where we're at. We're right back to our case of E of 0.2. This is also a case of E of 0.2, but it has the added benefit of greatly reducing the contraction effect. So we're gonna see a pretty dramatic improvement in hydraulic performance now. So we've lowered the, the headwater yet again, and remember we started all of this with our thin edge projecting, like a CNP projecting from the fill, at the very uppermost O-ring here. And we've dropped the headwater by this amount simply by changing the inlet configuration, by changing the inlet loss coefficient. And now in these designs, along with the bevel, but certainly in the tapers, improving the, the contraction, minimizing that contraction effect, allowing the area of the barrel to be more effectively utilized. The last inlet I have to show you is called a slope tapered inlet. This is tapered side to side, very similar to a side taper, but it also has a slope taper, a rapidly changing slope at the upstream end. The way we, we build these is we actually rotate the barrel down and then we kick the inlet back up, so this point daylights at the same location. What this does is it lowers the throat of the culvert so that for a given headwater elevation, we get more head acting on the culvert. So 
again, improved hydraulic performance, we're gonna see this drop even further by the amount of the rotation. And I'll mark this side taper location with a marker. And we'll see, now I have to take the step off to allow this slope tapered inlet, the inlet edge to be at the same location in elevation. And what we'll see is the headwater will drop basically by the amount of the rotation because we're allowing that much more head to act on the throat. And as you can see, it's already pretty close. The block was one inch, so we've dropped about one inch here from our side tapered location. And in fact, the barrel is very close to going full pipe, meaning it's nearly going back to outlet control. We've improved the entrance configuration and the inlet conditions so dramatically where this is no longer the constriction that it once was. The barrel is at times, we call this slug flow, it'll go full pipe for a, a little bit and then it'll oscillate back to, to part full supercritical. This is one reason, for example, in the Federal Highway Administration design standard, we look at both inlet and outlet control conditions on any culvert we analyze and we take the worst case because it's sometimes unpredictable as to where you'll be and you can have an oscillating headwater. So dramatic improvements with our tapered inlets. It's important to realize though that these improvements really only occur when you're in inlet control because everything that matters is at the entrance. In outlet control, there would be no value. You wouldn't recover the costs you've spent to build these tapered inlets, which are more expensive, because it's just one of many energy loss factors. You have the entrance loss, the friction loss, the exit loss. Friction loss typically being the greater of those three. So the, the benefits of a tapered inlet in particular in outlet control, it doesn't bring the value that it does in inlet control. So by review, in culvert design, the Federal Highway Administration design standard, based on hydraulic design series number five, is built on this idea of inlet and outlet control. In outlet control, all eight factors matter. Everything about the culvert installation is important in terms of the headwater that we're gonna get. In inlet control, only those factors at the entrance to the barrel are important. And the, uh, the biggest one is probably inlet configuration when we can, for a given pipe size and, and shape, adjust the inlet configuration to reduce the energy loss, we're gonna see improved hydraulic conditions. All of this information is reviewed in the hydraulic design series number five on culvert design. These equations and these relationships are also implemented in the Federal Highway Administration software program, HY8, for doing culvert design. So refer to those if you have additional uh, questions or the training course, the accompanying NHI training course on culvert design 135056. Thank you for your interest in Federal Highway Administration training. I hope you found this video on culvert hydraulics helpful.